Good morning, friends. We are on chapter 7. After Labor Day, we went back to school. That is, Sterling and I did. James Jr. went back to playing hooky. Sterling was going downtown to high school, grumbling that all the white kids wore better clothes than he did and had long pants while he was still knocking about in his knickers. Daddy told him he should have appreciated that nice suit with the long pants he got him from the pawn shop because God knows when he'd get the money to buy him another one. We didn't have any money at all, and that was the truth. When we got our relief check each month, all we did was take it across the street to Mr. Burnett, the West Indian grocer, and pay him what we owed. This left us with nothing, so the next day we started buying on credit again. Daddy said we'd never get out of the hole that way. It got so I hated to go across the street to Mr. Burnett's with our credit book clutched in my hand because his wife would look at you cross-eyed after you ordered all those bags of groceries then held out that book instead of money. And her snotty little daughter Yolanda was worse yet. It got so bad that both me and Rebecca hated to set foot in that store, and she would cry when her mother sent her there to buy something on credit. Today I was in the kitchen shelling some peas when Mother gave me a list of things to get for Mr. Burnett and handed me the credit book. I, I tried to pull a Rebecca by poking out my mouth and saying I didn't want to go. Mother looked at me like I was crazy. Don't give me no lip, Francie. Take that book across the street and get those groceries or I'll blister your behind again with the thick, thick end of the strop. Yes, Mother. I got three Kaiser rolls from the baker's. She handed me a nickel. And get three Kaiser rolls from the baker's. She handed me a nickel. I left in a hurry and sat down on the fourth landing to think how bad things were getting. Yesterday was the first time in my life I'd been whipped with the thick end of the strop, and here Mother was threatening to do it again. I needed a nickel so bad yesterday that when I saw Mr. Edwards and he didn't offer me one, I sort of suggested it to him. He gave me a dime, then squealed to Mother. Soon she came home from work. First thing Mother said to me as she came through the door, mad as she could be, was, Get me the razor strop. Since nobody else was there except her and me, I was worried about her asking for that strop like that. You're going to beat me, I asked. What did I do? How many times I got to tell you, Francie, that if something, if somebody got something for you, they'll give it to you without you having to ask for it. Go get me the strop. Mr. Edwards, I thought. That bastard ratted on me. I went to the bathroom and got the strop and walked back outside. I handed it to Mother and backed away. I only asked him for a nickel, Mother, and it wasn't like asking a stranger. She moved toward me, and I saw with horror how she was holding that strop. You ain't going to beat me with the thick end. I couldn't believe it, and I knocked over a chair, getting out of her way. Mother kept on coming. I ain't going to chase you all over this room, she said, and she snatched me and dragged me into her bedroom, flinging me down on the bed. I was too long-legged to be put across her lap, so she sort of kneeled on my back and pulled down my bloomers with one hand, raising the strop with the other. I told you before, and I ain't going to tell you again. Don't beg nobody for nothing. Each word was punctuated with a lash on my bare behind, and each lash raised a welt and a scream for me until I was hoarse. Don't beg nobody for nothing. Mother beat me so long, I think her arm got tired. I had asked Mr. Edwards for that nickel so I could have 15 cents to eat at Father Divine's because all we had at home was leftover cabbage, which hadn't been too tasty yesterday. The only other thing was that gold can jive, and nobody in their right mind would eat that mess. Anyway, after Mr. Edwards gave me the money, I walked up to 130th Street to get one of Father's delicious chicken dinners. Peace. It's wonderful. Father Devine's place was in a basement apartment. I paid my 15 cents at the door and found a seat at the, a round table in the middle of the room, crowded with men, women, and children, all eating silently. Some of them were Father's followers. I could tell by their nappy heads. But others were just hungry people like me. One of Father's angels, a huge black woman dressed in a bedsheet, brought me a plate of golden brown chicken from the kitchen. She nodded toward the bread and vegetables on the table, meaning for me to help myself. Instead of grace, she had to praise Father's holy name, so I turned to the man next to me and said, Father divine is God, would you please pass me the plate of black-eyed peas? When I finished eating, I walked back home, skirting Mount Morris Park. I liked the food at Father Divine's. You got plenty to eat for your 15 cents, but I always had to come alone. Nobody would come with me, not Sookie or Rebecca or even Maud. They were ashamed of those nappy-headed angels who wouldn't straighten their hair and wore white robes and change their names to Beloved Teresa or Sweet Morning Glory when they entered Father's kingdom. No, I thought now, as I got up off the steps and went on downstairs to go to the store, that dinner sure wasn't worth my whipping. Rebecca was sitting on my stoop talking to Duke from 119th Street. He was a raggedy black boy, and I don't know what Rebecca saw in him. I don't have to go to Mr. Burnett's no more, she bragged. I told my mother this morning I just wasn't going. Did she slap you upside your head, I asked. No, she sent Maud instead. There was something chilly about Maud. What I mean is, she didn't get all hot and bothered about things like me and Rebecca did. 
Maud went with me now to get the gold can jive and prunes from the relief office into a church on 121st Street where we got day-old bread for five cents a loaf. I went to the bakery first, wishing I had a younger sister to send to the store. Three poppy seed rolls, I told Max, who was standing behind the high counter. He was so short his pinpoint head could just be seen over the top. I looked at the cinnamon buns in the case, wishing I had a nickel to buy me some. Max saw me looking at them, and when he handed me the bag of rolls, he said, You want a cinnamon bun, Francie? I don't have no more money, I said, handing him the nickel for the rolls. He put a cinnamon bun in the bag. Come in the back for a minute, he said. No, thank you. I've got to go to the grocery store for my mother. He took the cinnamon bun back. The stingy bastard, I thought, as I crossed the street slowly, dreading every step of the way. Max should have given me a bun for that free feel he got last night. I'd been playing Ringo Levia with the twins and Sookie and went and hid in the telephone booth in Max's store. He'd come with a brew and pretended to be sweeping in front of the booth and got himself a good feel before I was able to get out of there. A group of boys was walking down the street, and wouldn't you know they'd stopped right in front of the grocery store to cut up? I moaned at my bad luck. They made me feel so miserable that ordinarily to avoid passing them I'd cross the street, but there was no escaping them today. Skibopedi, the skinny ones for me, the blackest boy of the bunch yelled. I braced myself, staring straight ahead and walked past them. You give me yours and I'll give you mine, another boy hollered. I'm talking about your cherry. He did a tap dance, poking out his belly at me, and the other boys broke up laughing. I escaped into the store, but my luck was still bad. It wasn't Mr. Burnett, a jolly West Indian behind the counter, but his fat yellow wife, a Yolanda, nine, light-skinned and plump like her mother, with long braids hanging down her back, was perched on a high stool next to the rice sack. Hello, Mrs. Burnett. Hello, Yolanda. They both grunted at me. Three pounds of rice, I read from the list, adding as Mrs. Burnett went to the five cents a pound stack. Three pounds for ten cents. She grunted again and scooped up the cheaper rice. Ten cents worth of dried herrings. They's fifteen cents a pound. My mother only wants ten cents worth. My voice was barely above a whisper. She threw the herrings on the scale and snatched them off before I could see how much she had given me. I read the rest of the items off the list and watched as Mrs. Burnett wrote the prices on a large paper bag and added them up. That will be two dollars and ninety-eight cents. I caught my breath and held out the credit book. It seemed like forever I was holding that book out, and she looked at it like she never saw it before, which was silly. She saw it almost every day. When do you all get your relief check? she asked. The first of the month, Mrs. Burnett. I knew it was the she knew it was the first. She knew it, she knew it. Finally she took the book, grumbling under her breath, wrote the figure on it, and threw it on top of the groceries. She pushed the bag toward me and I picked it up from the counter. All of this time Yolanda's black button eyes were burning a hole in my back. She never played with the rest of us, and I didn't know why me and Rebecca let her get on our nerves. After all, she was only nine, going on ten, but she sat there on that stool, silent and snotty, making me feel that it was not only her store, but her world, and I had no place in it. But being in the hawk but being in hawk to the grocer wasn't enough to make our social worker, Madam Queen, happy. The next time she came up to check on us, she told Daddy he had to be making some extra money somewhere because we spent more on rent and food than what the relief gave us. She was right. Daddy wasn't bringing home hardly anything from his numbers, but Mother was still working three half days for Mrs. Schwartz and Sterling brought home a couple bucks now and then from his shoe shining. I ain't working, Miss Peters, Daddy told her. How many times have I, ha How many times I have to tell you that? He was standing up straight and tall, looking down at her, sitting in our dining room table. Her papers and figures spread out before her. I hoped her glasses would pinch her nose off. Is anybody in this household working, Adam? No. I don't understand, then, how you can pay your rent and food and gas bill. We manage this, Miss Peters. But where do you get the money from if no one is working? We just get it somehow. And somebody is bringing in extra money. No, Miss Peters. We don't have one dime except what y'all give us. They kept at it like that for ten minutes more, and I could have slapped her yellow face for pushing Daddy into a corner like that. When she finally left, Daddy said wearily, They don't give you enough money to live on, so you have to bootleg some kind of work. Then they want to deduct that from your relief check, too. I wonder how they expect you to live. Didn't I tell you I didn't want to mess with those people? But for once he didn't shout, seeming to be more tired than angry. I had been upstairs playing jacks with Maud and was going home now, but it was too dark to go over the roof, so I was running down the stairs. I stopped short when I saw Sonny on the ground floor. Hello, Sonny. Hello, Francie. I walked slowly down the last steps. Come on, Sonny said, dancing around and aiming his fist at my jaw. Let's box. I threw up my hands to protect myself and backed up. 
The next thing I knew, we were in the shadows behind the stairs, and Sonny was leaning all over me, pulling my dress up. I don't want a box no more, I said. I want to go home. Let me put it in you for a minute, Franzi. Then his bare flesh, hot and wet and hard, was on my thigh. Open your legs a little, Franzi. No! Suddenly I was scared. I tried to dodge around him, but he reached out with one arm and flung me back against the wall. It won't hurt, Franzi. He was rubbing himself up and down against me, one hand beneath the elastic leg of my bloomers and the other at my waist, trying to pull my bloomers down. No, I don't want to. Frantic now, I held on to my bloomers with both hands, but they were slowly being forced down as Sonny poked his thing at me and tried to stick it over the top of my bloomers. I stopped struggling for a moment to get my breath. Just as my bloomers were about to slide down over my knees, I wrenched free and hauled them back up, hauled them back up. Sonny grabbed me again. Then we heard somebody bouncing down the stairs singing. I held my breath and Sonny, Sonny stopped his jiggling, both of us listening for the front door to slam. But instead, the singing came closer. I recognized Valley's voice just before I saw him heading for the dark under the stairs. He had on one of Rebecca's cotton dresses and he was pulling up his knickers. He took the dress off and bundled it into a ball. He was whistling now, walking toward us to hide that dress under the stairs, I thought. Sonny buttoned up his pants, his fingers stumbling in haste, and I pulled my dress down. Hold your hands up higher. Suddenly, Sonny suddenly hollered and went into his fighter stance. I just stood there, scared and dumb. Who's that back there? Valley asked. Sonny danced out into the light shadow boxing. Me and Franzi, he said. I was showing her how Joe Lewis delivers his powerhouse upper right cross. Pow! Sonny aimed one at Valley's chin. Valley ducked. Sonny laughed and shadow boxed himself right out into the vestibule. The door slammed shut behind him. I walked toward Valley, looking everywhere except Adam. What was you doing behind the stairs with Sonny? He asked. What? You screw you. You crazy or something. What was you doing back there with him? We was boxing. That's what they call it now, huh? I wasn't doing nothing. I don't want to ever do nothing. I started to cry. Oh, Franzi, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. But Franzi, please don't cry. He wiped my face with the dress and then he kissed me on the cheek. When I didn't move, his lips touched mine for an instant, pressing down firmly. You all right now? I nodded. I wasn't doing nothing with Sonny. Honest, I wasn't. I believe you, Franzi, but don't let him hem you up in a dark corner any more. He don't mean you no good, okay? Okay, Valley. We went outside, crossed over to my stoop, and he walked me upstairs to my door. I was hoping he would kiss me on the mouth again. I liked that, but he didn't. I listened to him galloping down the stairs, and then I went on inside. The next afternoon, Rebecca and I went to Aleppo Theater. Apollo, Aleppo, Apollo Theater. We sat upstairs in the buzzard's roost because it only, it only cost a dime, although the sweet fumes from those skinny cigarettes the boys were smoking was so thick it gave me a headache. Ralph Cooper was the master of ceremonies, and him and the Butterbeans and Susie made me laugh till I hurt. The picture was good, too. Janet Gaynor and Lionel Barrymore and Stepan Fetchett in To Carolina. Everybody laughed at Step and Fetch It, and so did I, because he was funny and a big movie star and making all that money, but sometimes I wished he wasn't such a shuffling, lazy person. When the show was over, we walked right into a riot. We had walked to Lennox Avenue and saw a crowd near 126th Street and went up there. A wooden platform was up in the street and several black and white men yelling into a microphone. There were hundreds of people milling around and a whole lot of cops swinging their billy clubs and hollering at the crowd to move on. I saw one cop wrap a negro right in the middle of his forehead and draw blood. I shuddered and turned away. A banner over the platform said, Welcome home, Mrs. Ada Wright, mother of Roy and Andy. We would have gone on home then, except that Rebecca suddenly yelled, Hey, that's Robert up there on the platform. I looked, and sure enough, it was. He grabbed the microphone and began hollering into it, Do not disperse. We have a right to meet in our own streets. Just then, a whole row of police cars drove up. As the cops jumped out, they threw something into the air. Tear gas! Somebody yelled, Oh my God, they're gassing us! The crowd, which had been pressing up against the platform, scattered. People grabbed their throats, strangling as the air about them turned smoky. Just then Robert saw us and shouted at me and Rebecca to get out of there. We turned and ran with the crowd. The cops were chasing us up Lennox Avenue. People upstairs on their fire escapes... People upstairs on their fire escapes and hanging from their windows threw rotten fruit down on the police. Get one of those bastards, somebody yelled as a banana skin fell on top of a cop's cap. Come on, Rebecca cried. We'd better better get out of here before they start shooting. A soggy tomato fell at my feet. I picked it up and threw it at the nearest cop. Then Rebecca and I ran down to Fifth Avenue and went home. I told Mother about the riot, and we sat in the dining room drinking tea, waiting for the boys to come home. Sterling came in first, and then around midnight, James Jr. showed up. Mother made me go on to bed. 
Hours later, I woke up and went into the dining room. Mother was still sitting at the table waiting. My eyes met hers and I saw fear in them. She was waiting for Daddy and I realized for the first time that I wasn't the only one in that house who was always afraid the worst had happened. Go on back to bed, Franzi. Yes, Mother. At daybreak, Daddy came home and Mother finally went to bed. The next day, the front page of the papers was full of it. 5,000 Negroes and white sympathizers rioted yesterday when detectives used tear gas bombs to disperse an unauthorized meeting staged at Len Lennox Avenue and 126th Street to protest the Scottsboro case. The paper said the Inter International Labor Defense Committee planned the meeting to welcome home Mrs. Ada Wright, mother of two of the Scottsboro boys, Roy and Andy. She had been to Alabama to see them, and Harlem was welc welcoming her home. I stopped reading in disgust when the paper said that the police didn't use clubs or pistols against the rioters. If that wasn't a billy club that cop used on that colored man's head, then I was stone blind. The paper also said three people were arrested, two white men and a Negro. Thank God it wasn't Robert, but his picture was on the paper up there on that platform, and on account of it, he lost the job he got as a, he just got as a delivery boy downtown in the garment center because he hadn't gone to work that day, but had taken off sick. The next night, the whole courtyard could hear Robert's argument with Elizabeth. I was lying on Mother's bed, and their voices rose up plain and clear in the air shaft, which our bedroom windows opened on. How come you let those communists make you lose your job? Elizabeth asked. The Black League for Freedom ain't communist, Robert said. We just helped the defense committee set up the meeting. The paper says you're all a bunch of communists. Screw the papers. You care more about them Scottsboro boys than you do about your own sons starving right under your nose. They're not starving right under my nose. You're working, ain't you? Liz, I got to care what happens to black people in Alabama. Nine colored boys are condemned to die because two white sluts said they raped them. Ain't that a bitch? Can't you understand what, that what happens to them down south is part of what happens to us here in Harlem? All I understand is I ain't going to be working my butt off in no laundry while you're parading and marching up and down getting your picture in the papers. I just ain't going to do it, so you'd better stop losing jobs and messing around with those communists. How many times I got to tell you the Black League ain't? I don't care what they ain't. They ain't paying you a dime. That I know. And you laying up here like a king in my mother's house and... You want me to leave your mother's house? Just keep shouting and screaming like that. You want me to leave? There was silence. I waited and waited for Elizabeth to answer, but she never did. Finally, disgusted with waiting, I got into my own bed and fought with the bed bugs and finally fell asleep. The next morning when I went to get Maude for school, Robert was still there and I didn't hear Elizabeth arguing with him anymore either. In fact, she looked kind of silly, smiling and giggling about nothing, and I wondered what old Robert had done to make her so happy like that for a hot minute. Mr. Edwards hit 505 for $2 and said he was going to New Orleans to look for his wife and his cousin, Gabriel. I was glad because I wasn't mad at him anymore for making me get that beating. When I told him about it the next day, he swore he hadn't meant to get me in Dutch, and I believed him. But Mr. Edwards didn't get paid off in his, on his hit. The bankers changed that last figure to a six when they found out that a whole mess of people in Harlem had that number. And a plane had crashed that day before, and its picture was in the news with a 505 painted on one wing. It's a shame, Daddy said. The way the racketeers can change a number any time they want, they want to as if the thousand to one odds against hitting ain't enough for them. Mr. Edwards thought it was more than a shame. He went raving and cursing up to his collector, demanding his money, and got shot twice for his trouble. He died three days later in Harlem Hospital. There was no funeral because one of his relatives sent his body straight away to New Orleans, and I thought it was kind of sad for Mr. Edwards to get back home that way. They didn't keep that man who shot Mr. Edwards in jail no time before they turned him loose. They just don't give a damn, Daddy said. With Mr. Edwards gone, we didn't have a janitor, and our Jewish landlord coming down from Mount Vernon and offered Daddy the janitor's job. He took it, and it became a lot It became our lot to pull the garbage and mop down the stairs, keeping the backyard clean, which was none too easy since it was simpler to throw garbage out the window into the backyard than to wait until six o'clock when the garbage was pulled. That dumbwaiter was a filthy, slimy mess, a permanent home for cockroaches and rats, and I would just as soon open the window myself and sling the garbage out than open that dumbwaiter door. Daddy got up at five o'clock in the morning to start the furnace in the basement before somebody started banging on the, pops for, the pipes for hot water. But he made James Jr. and Sterling bank the fire at night, and that kept Jr. a little closer to home. We had been janitors before, a long time ago, when I was four, and we lived in that basement in Brooklyn with the furnace pipes standing right in the middle of every room. 
I remember, because we were the only colored in that whole block, and I used to play with a pretty little Jewish girl, Rosina, who lived up on the third floor and had a brand new baby brother. She had the youngest, nicest parents, and her father always made us laugh by jumping into the baby's crib to read his newspaper every evening when he came home. I used to go up there just to see him do that. Then he would hug us both and give us a lollipop he had hidden in his coat pocket. Me and Rosina started kindergarten together and were best friends because while there were two or three other colored kids in our school, janitor's children too, they didn't live near me. Now that I think back on it, things were real nice there in Brooklyn. We had a telephone and one of those radios with earplugs and we would, that we would listen to every evening and have a good time together. And mother didn't work and was always at home. But after we, after we moved to Harlem, we seemed to get poorer and poorer. I asked mother once why we ever left Brooklyn. And she said so daddy could take a better job painting, but it didn't turn out to be steady because of the depression. Now I thought, with daddy being a janitor again, maybe things would be nicer like when we used to live in Brooklyn. But that janitor's job only got us in trouble. It was on account of that, of it, that Madam Queen cut us off from relief because daddy hadn't told her about it right away. But I didn't receive any pay for being the janitor, daddy told Madam Queen. Only a reduction in rent, just half. I was going to tell you next month after we caught up. We owe most of our relief check to the grocer, and I was just trying to break even before I told you. But Madam Queen didn't believe Daddy. As, a, as good as called him a liar, and to punish us, she took us off relief. Mother told Daddy Mrs. Schwartz's sister wanted her to work part-time, and maybe that would help some. Daddy didn't say anything, so Mother took the job and was gone now every afternoon instead of just three times a week. Now that she was away so much, we didn't eat dinner together anymore. Junior and Sterling came home at different times and ate in the kitchen. Daddy would put on some mustard greens before he left on his rounds, and when I came home from school, I would turn them off and cook a pot of rice. Daddy was a jishi, so we had rice every day, me and that rice. It was either scorched or a soggy mess. Once Daddy looked at it with disgust, that day it was soggy. Why in hell you didn't teach this girl to cook a decent pot of rice? He roared at Mother. My feelings were hurt. Mother didn't bother to answer, her silence saying louder than words that he was home all day, so why didn't he teach me himself? You a moron or something? He turned on me. Well, you can't cook a decent pot of rice. My tears were instant. I measure it out just like you do, Daddy, only it, it gets dry while it's still raw, so I add more water. The gas, the gas, Daddy yelled. You got the damn gas turned up too high. You don't boil rice, you steam it. The sight of my tears didn't make him turn gentle as it usually did. He finished eating and banged out the house, mumbling, banged out of the house, mumbling that it was a goddamn shame a man couldn't get a decent pot of rice in his own home. I felt bad for hours because Daddy seldom hollered at me, but after that I didn't cook any more soggy pots of rice. That Saturday night I was up late because there was no school the next day. Me and Mother were home alone. She was in her bedroom figuring out the lead for Monday. Daddy had taught her his system, and I was sitting at the dining room table reading a library book, armed with my usual supply of weapons. Tonight I had a hammer, a screwdriver, and two hairbrushes. When I heard a noise, I threw the hammer toward the kitchen, and the rats scurried back into their holes. When they got down to my last piece of ammunition, I would give the dining room up to the rats and go on to bed. I was scared to death of those rats. They had already bitten everybody but me. They'd tell me that when I was a baby, they had to keep me in a laundry basket on top of the dresser to protect me from those rats. Our rats grew fat on the poison Mother spread around each week on raw potato slices, and the sulfur bomb she was always gassing us with had no effect on them whatsoever. Once they chased a cat we had right into the living room wall, and I bet that cat kept on running till we got to Brooklyn. We had finally deserted the fairy tales at the li I had finally deserted the fairy tales at the library, more out of shame than anything else, and had discovered a row of bookcases called the Negro section, with books in it about colored people. I was reading Home to Harlem by Claude McKay, and it was a strange to discover that someone had written about those same, these same raggedy streets I knew so well. The people in the book acted just like those clowns out there on Fifth Avenue, and it was very funny and kind of sad, but I couldn't keep my mind on the book because I was hoping James Jr. would beat Daddy home so there wouldn't be another argument. I threw the screwdriver down the hall, and just then there was a loud banging on the dining room door. Sudden noises scared me. Usually it meant something terrible had happened, so I just sat there with my heart pounding, not making a move. What's the matter with you, Franzi? Mother grumbled as she went to the door. Can't you hear all that banging? You act more like a moron each day. It was true. I was getting scared of everything. It was Sookie's mother, her moroney face redder than usual after she, after her climb up to the top floor. Mr. Coffinholm, she asked. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. They ain't here, Mother said. What's the matter? 
You better sit down, Mrs. Coffin, Mrs. Maceo said, bending her tall frame into a chair. No, Mother said, stiffening. What is it? They found a white man dead in a hallway around 118th Street. That was about seven o'clock, I guess. Didn't you hear about it? Mother shook her head. Well, he was mugged to death. Didn't have no pants on when they found him. She looked at me. How come you didn't hear about it, Francie? I've been upstairs all evening, I said, wondering if that was all she came to tell us. I started to relax. The cops just busted into that basement where the Ebony Earls hold their meetings, Mrs. Maceo said, and they done arrested all them boys, holding them for murder. I felt a curious stillness, like my heart and the world had just stopped running. Mother fell into a chair, her hand going up to her mouth in that familiar gesture she used when she laughed and exposed her toothless gums. James Jr., she asked. He arrested too. Mrs. Maceo nodded. Him in Valley and four other boys from Madison Avenue. I always knew this day was coming, Mother said slowly. I always knew I would turn a corner and run into this day, but I ain't prepared for it, no how. The next morning, his picture stared up at me from the front page of the Daily News. That white, bald-headed man who used to hang out on my roof and follow me to the movies. He was the man Junior and Valley were arrested for murdering. Have a good day, friends.